British political figure, but of course we have some American guests. Uh, you, even you will have probably heard uh, that our speaker has been uh, the, the sort of one of the great uh, drivers of uh, British city policy throughout his distinguished political career as a very uh, senior um, cabinet minister and leading uh, light of um, both originally the Thatcher government and later as a central figure in John Major's government in which I had great pleasure uh, to work in a junior position um, uh, and felt, um, felt that uh, working for Michael Heseltine was intellectually and personally inspiring. So uh, for both of the reasons that he is very uh, interested in the area that we've been discussing today and because of the leadership he's shown on this particular issue intellectually, I'm delighted to welcome Michael Heseltine. Gani, thank you. Um, I've got uh, 10 to 15 minutes to discuss the whole history of urban policy, and uh, I think that would stretch the intellectual cap capacity of most people. Uh, so it will be a very subjective um, few words I have to say, but there may be some time for questions, which anyone knows are always the most interesting part of everything, every speech. Um, uh, it's been a huge privilege, and I'm extraordinarily lucky in that time and again, very, very unusually in politics, I've gone back to the same agenda. Uh, I was involved in the 70s for two years in planning and um, in a junior capacity uh, in the Department of the Environment. I became Secretary of State for the Department for three years in 79. I became Secretary of State for another two and a half years in 1990. And the culmination of it all was when David Cameron asked me to write a, um, a critique of government um, economic policy with a view to stimulating more growth. So uh, over that period, from the very early 70s until literally I'm still involved in the process, uh, I, I, there were very, very few politicians who've had a privilege of that sort. And um, the, the sort of, there were some sort of generalizations which are easy to come to. Um, the, the most uh, obvious one to me is that if you don't get an effective partnership between the public and the private sectors, you don't get anywhere. And so all the sort of simplistic jargon uh, just doesn't stand up to any intellectual scrutiny. Um, the, the, there are things that the public sector can do and do extremely well. There are things that only the private sector can do, and uh, without a partnership, the chances are that you have a serious problem. Uh, uh, <coughs> you've only got to see what the planning system can do if it is ineffectively administered. I mean, no one's going to get rid of the planning system, but there are ways in which you can get decisions very rapidly, and ways in which a very similar decision can take you an interminable period. I mean, the, the, the classic example is the industrial inward investment billion pound contract, which is footloose and can come here or overseas, and a, a, the word gets out to a local authority that a site is needed. Uh, that would normally require years in which huge hassle and deliberation and consultation would take place. But if the word is that the guy is coming from Korea to make a decision next week and he wants answers, my God, he'll get them. Um, the, the other side of the issue, the publicly owned land, is a scandal. Uh, it is there, it is derelict, and it is often passed from one department to another or with a division in a department from one section to another. And the one thing that they can all agree about is not to let anyone else get hold of it. So in the middle ground is dereliction, um, which is an accumulation of the detritus of the past, often created by the private sector who have now moved on as markets have changed. And you've got a large area which is polluted. Uh, it has a negative value. Uh, no private sector is going to develop negative value if they can find green fields which have a positive value. 
and in my experience it is only the private public sector that can be expected to go in effectively and remove the negative value in order to create the market environment in which the private <coughs> sector will follow. So these are easy generalizations. Um, another very uh, difficult for politicians to grasp and well to, to articulate is how unpredictable the whole thing is. I, I, one of my most exciting experiences was taking over 6,000 uh, acres of dereliction in the east of London in 1979 and uh, everyone was against me. Literally all my political colleagues were against me because it was too expensive and it was intervention. The civil servants were against me because I was taking over powers from local government. Local government was against me for exactly the same reason. And um, so uh, I saw all about the inertia in this position. But if I had said, if I was now cast your mind back to 1979, um, and I was able to stand here tonight and say, I've got the privilege in telling you I have secured the Prime Minister's support to take on 6,000 acres of derelict land in the east of London. To which the first question is, well, I thought it would be good, it would be, you know, it's expensive, it would cost us a fortune, what's going to happen? I said, no, oh, no, this is going to be a triumph. We're going to have the biggest financial centre developed uh, in London that we have ever seen. We are going to have the Dome, which is the biggest uh, uh, entertainment centre in Europe. We're going to win the Olympics. We're going to have HS1 coming through through Stratford. We're going to have an airport in the middle of the East End of London. We're going to have Excel, um, which um, is going to be an exhibition centre of world class. That's what I'm going to deliver. You'd have hustled me out of the room with the men in white coats still on the other. <laughs> the unpredictability of it. And equally, and, but interestingly unpredictable, only one of those projects was British. So you had Paul Reichman, the Canary Wharf, you had uh, uh, the, the Dome from America, you had Excel from Malaysia, uh, so it went on. Um, you had the Australians to build the Olympic Park. Um, only only um, the air airport was done by Merlin's a British company. So, incredibly unpredictable, opportunities created, took time, you just had to believe in it. And it was all public sector led. A triumph for the private sector once the public sector had taken the decisions. Now, I mean, that, that's a big and easy scheme to talk about, but my experience of all this urban renaissance business cannot be separated from those very simple lessons. See who's got to do what, make the decisions, get it done. And if I had one other thing, there are probably lots of things I should say, but one thing that I do think is important, who is going to do what? And what is the structure of decision making? I have the simplest little philosophy in life born of the private sector. Show me a problem, show me who's in charge. And in, you'll be very rarely disappointed. Uh, the, the person in charge will have a million reasons why it's not his or her fault, but actually change that person and get someone <coughs> in who can do it. And look at the structure. What is actually happening on the ground? And I, I, I'm going to give you two examples of where uh, I'm, I'm involved and believe change is either coming or is very necessary. When I did the report for David Cameron about economic growth, um, I didn't really learn anything new in the exercise I conducted because I'd been involved in this issue for so long. But the privilege that he accorded to me, which I think is unique, is he gave me an official from each government department to work for me. Now, and for those of you who've never been in the government department, it's quite difficult for you to understand the enormity of that. <laughs> because basically, officials have got a huge responsibility. I mean, I'm a great fan of civil servants, but, but uh, they have got many disciplines and many interrelated disciplines. Um, and so they will double check everything they do for you to make sure you're not offending or countervening government policy or traditions or whatever it may be. That's their job. No, no complaints about that. 
So there is a sort of great network of activity and interdependence. But suddenly you've got one guy who can say what he likes without censorship, and these civil servants are there to make it happen, to get into government departments, to find the evidence, regardless of whether it suits the government department. So it was the most extraordinary privilege. Now, what was the thesis that came out of it? London, in my view, is a functional monopoly. You only have to name the departments to know what I mean. Transport, environment, housing, defense, health, whatever it is. <coughs> Absolutely preoccupied by the functional responsibilities that they have. But something else has happened over a couple of hundred years. London is now arguably the world's greatest city, but certainly one of them. And in the United Kingdom, preeminently huge and economically successful. It wasn't like that. That wasn't what made this country what it was. If you think of the names which are worldwide brands, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle, Bristol, these were the great buccaneers of the first move of advantage of the 18th century. And they were tough guys. I mean, they got out there and they broadly won more than they lost. That is the story of the British Empire. Uh, they weren't the nicest lot of people on earth <laughs> and th they created huge wealth and that was what they were about but the condition of the people was appalling and so democracy understandably um, took over and over a period of 200 years fast forwarding to the outcome actually the buccaneers obsessed with wealth became councillors distributing social welfare in the widest sense, if you think about social housing, education, roads, environment, <coughs> whatever it may be, it was done by a group of people who were councillors. Uh, nothing against councillors, but over 200 years, you had changed the whole dynamic of our cities. Uh, but you've done some things well. In order to provide the equalization of uh, social provision, you had to get a lot of money from wealthy areas in order to provide a similar level of service from less wealthy areas. And so the tax circulation process meant that the buccaneers delivered, the London power structure absorbed and redistributed functionally. So uh, you can see that where the buccaneers were obsessed by Liverpool, Manchester, whatever it may be, they all, they all knew each other, they worked together, they thought about the, the whole, how do you, we must have a Manchester ship canal. Can you think of anything crazier than that? You know, they built a Manchester ship canal to get to the sea. That was done by a collective Manchester determination. <coughs> I was in the Potteries the other day. They built a canal from the Potteries to the Humber. Unbelievable. But that was the sort of people they were, and that's what made those sort of, that atmosphere. That's all gone. And the, the whole process of functionalizing and monopolizing, because London with its functional monopoly told them what they could do and what they couldn't do in ever more obsessive detail. So, uh, my report said, well look, I think it might be a bad idea to try and change that. Let's actually trust a bit more the people who make the money, who know what the local problems are. And as a sort of reflection on my experiences, in my whole political career in government, I only ever remember one meeting about a city, and that was Liverpool in 1981. And the conclusion didn't actually further the cause of Liverpool particularly. But that was the only one we ever met to discuss. Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Newcastle. What we did discuss was housing or <coughs> whatever. So the, 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 the conclusion of my report argued for a massive restoration of initiative and power to the local environment. And the local environment, uh, called local enterprise partnerships, as you will know, Broadly, they are a partnership between the best of the private sector and the public sector, whether they be the university vice-chancellors or the local authorities or the leaders of the uh, private sector. 
they are the people stimulating this process. And we, we are yet to see the first results of it, we will see it in over a month's time, when the bids come up. But they are, as a first step, transformational in that for the first time in English history, it's quite a big claim, <coughs> leaders of a community have had the chance to influence the plan economically upon which their future depends. We'll see how they get on with it. I am optimistic. I said there were two things I wanted to say, because it's, it's, the next appears to be microeconomic. It's not micro, but it seems to be compared with what I've just said. It's all about the same functional monopolistic approach. I've never, I certainly have not, have no personal experience of hardship or poverty or anything of that sort. But, uh, and I've never, I have had experience in politics of it because I created a strategy in the 90s to tackle deprived communities. It was called City Challenge. It came to an end when we lost um, power in 97. But I've always been preoccupied about how the urban poor are dealt with. Of course, the language which, in which the issue is discussed here is about money, and there's never enough, and it's always about the cuts, and nobody caring, etc., etc. But of course, the urban poor cost an incredible amount of money to sustain. Uh, the moment you think about it, um, you know, the social programs, the educational programs, the training programs, the unemployed programs, all of these programs are very, very yeah. expensive. So <clears throat> I said to the Labour leader of Birmingham some time ago, I said, look, could we, could we just, I'd like to go and look at a community. You must know, you, everyone in this room will know the names of what are, let's call them sink estates because that's what they are, however politically incorrect it may be to use the words, but that's, what, that's where they put those people. And I said, oh, just, let's, let's go, that's just you and me, and, and, and we'll organize a meeting, uh, if you will agree, of the people who administer these large sums of money. And he said, yeah, fine, let's do that. So we went, and uh, well-meeting, decent, hard-working people, they turned up, Social Services Department from the county, uh, the, the borough in that case, the, the, the assistant chief constable, policeman, guy dealing with a particular problem the government had dealt with, called drugs, or someone else dealing with troubled families, somebody uh, from the Department of Work and Pensions who was, got, was running a job centre, all there. And uh, so I said, when did you last meet? <laughs> Never met. Who's in charge? Someone in charge? We, we, I, I do the troubled families. I do the police. No one was in charge. And so you can see where the simple philosophy that I set out at the beginning comes from. Nobody in charge. No structure. Consequent no ladders of aspiration. It was all about sustaining the deprivation, making the deprivation <coughs> tolerable in political terms. What I want is to say, look, we can do better. It doesn't need to be like this. There must be a way to improve your opportunities, your environment. Now, it will be more interventionist. Not a great deal more because the intervention is very acute already, the troubled families and drugs and all that sort of thing. But another example of this which makes my point, I was in Nottingham a few months ago at an outer estate which had many of the characteristics I'm describing and there was a voluntary organisation trying to find vacant uh, uh, people to apply for apprenticeships. And this is an area of 10, 11 percent unemployed. And they couldn't find them. They couldn't find those kids who could apply for the apprenticeships. So I said, well, where's the central register? Where, who, what's, who has a list of these people? And no one had a list of these people. So the voluntary organization couldn't get a list of the people to see what, what, what the chances were. 
Well, that's a, that's a minute example of a, what I call a fairly minute example. But, but anyway, my point is now, I think, clearly in front of you. We are spending incredible sums of public money turning our backs on the existence of this problem and managing it totally ineffectively. So uh, that's my contribution for today. Michael was very kindly uh, agreed to take questions. So um, there's one back there. There's a microphone on. If you wouldn't mind using it, and just very quickly saying who you are before you ask your question. Ben Hillman from Policy Studies Institute. Lord Heseltine, I'd simply wish to ask you on what grounds you justify the pursuit of economic growth without differentiating between that part of growth which is good for us and that which is damaging for us. And I'm thinking in this context of any fossil fuel based activity because it is adding, as I'm sure you know, to the accumulation of greenhouse gases which is melting the Arctic ice cap uh, and which is now out of control. There is no means whereby we can reverse that process. So to make it even worse, even less intractable seems to be uh, almost mindless. Do you accept the principle that economic growth should be differentiated between what is good for the future of our children and that which is bad for them? I would slightly rephrase your qualification, what is legal and what is illegal. Because you have very strong views, those are not universal views. So for you to make a statement of the sort you did, whilst I might be sympathetic to it, does not constitute an illegal position. So it's your view. Democracy is there to reconcile your view with other people's views. And my guess is they will find on your side increasingly. But my, so my answer to your question is, we go for growth because of the huge benefits to everybody associated with that, and look around if you want to see why. But the test is not your judgment, it is what the law allows you to do. It is, it is for the politicians to create the framework within which the law determines. But what about the evidence of the fact? No, but this, sorry, no, it, no, I'm afraid, no, I'm afraid it is an opinion. There, there's plenty of evidence, but there, what we know throughout history, the, the Luddites, the introduction of new machinery, there have been endless examples of resistance to change on the basis of social uh, tolerance and social arguments. So you, you have got to have someone to make the decisions. It can't be you or me, it has to be governments. Based on okay, so well, let's well, just whatever. Uh, well, based on votes. We're going to distribute the questions around. Um, Gareth from Cisco Systems. So, thank you. Um, question We've been discussing today how very centralised state, uh, you know, we nationalised industries a long time ago, we ran them into the ground. But now when we're hearing almost as though we're berating the regional authorities for being emasculated. For being what? For being emasculated of power, wealth. And now we're suddenly insistent that they've got state control again. That takes time. What structures would you suggest the government give to the regions to be able to actually raise income, spend as they see fit, and be responsible locally for the electorate? Well, there are two things. The local enterprise partnerships are there. They're working. We have given them the first tranche of money. And um, I, I don't see any substantial need to change. Uh, I do believe it's fundamentally important that they should be competitive, that they should, what the government gives them, they should get by proving in competition with the other LEPs that they can do a good job. What I don't believe in is automatic handing out of money, because that gives complacency and, and, and takes the whole thrust out of it. So we have a framework, it's there. Alex Jones, Centre for Cities. Uh, what would you like to see in the manifestos to really take this agenda forward? And is there anything beyond no stone unturned, or is that, in a way, your manifesto for the manifestos? Oh, no, I, 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 there are things I, I, I would do. Um, I, I think it's no stone unturned went for unitary authorities, it went for directly elected chief executives, so that's, that, that's all on the agenda. Where, where I missed out 
was what I now call bending spending. Um, if, if I'm just a little bit detailed to show you what I mean. Uh, England is divided into 39 local enterprise partnerships. They are all in competition for the pot that has been designated by the government. And I, I'm now going to invent figures, so please, I'm literally clutching figures out of the air. They have no meaning whatsoever, purely as an example. Of the 39 LEPs, let us assume that 25 of them are good, the bids. That leaves 14 that are not so good. Let us assume that of the 14, you're not writing it, no, I don't <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Let's assume of the 14 that um, uh, nine of them are because the LEPs are not up to the job of making a decent plan, which leaves me with five. And the reason why the five are not good is because there are no natural strengths in that local economy on which to build. And it's not difficult. The Economist wrote an article a few months ago saying abandon. There's nothing you can do with these places. I wholly reject that argument, and democracy will reject that argument. But that is a solution of sorts. Um, it's what they said to me about Liverpool in 1979. Um, but coming back to the bending spending. If you haven't got any strengths in your local economy, it isn't much use of government saying we'll reward you to build on your strengths. So, what do you do? Well, you could, as I say, follow the argument which simply says, let it go, it's all gone too late, it's too far down the road, goodbye and good luck. But what my report did not itemise is the capital expenditure programs of the rest of government that does not go through local authorities. I just dealt with the local authority end of it. And when you start thinking about that, you've got highways, you've got the defense budget, you've got the hospital budget, you've got a huge capital program in education, including universities. So, if you've got a bombed out economy, and there are some, and you're going to build a regional hospital. Well, regional hospitals are not going to be that many. They're going to be very big, very expensive, and the patients and their relatives are going to have to travel. So where you put them is pretty arbitrary, for, because a lots of people will have to do the traveling. OK, so spot the deprived economy and say, that's where we're going to put the regional hospital. Excuse me, before we commit ourselves, Get me the chairman of Glaxo on the phone. Hello, Bill. I'm thinking of building a regional hospital. Be interested in your view about what the specialism of that hospital ought to be. Oh, and by the way, where were you with the particular oncology processes that you're developing and, and looking to in the future? Have you thought of some sort of relationship with a regional hospital where you were able da 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 da? And, and look, I've had this, this property guy on the phone who said he's looking for an opportunity to develop startup businesses off the back of the pharmaceutical industry. And he's a very interesting fellow. He comes from uh, uh, Vietnam, actually, and he's made a lot of money there. Um, and he wants to get into the UK, and he wants to have a starter factory unit for a thousand small businesses. Will you be free for lunch next week to come and have a talk to see what we could put together before you know where you are, you've got a cluster, you've got academic excellence, you've got a regional hospital, you've got something on which you can build. Now, I, I give you an example, but if you think about it, we're just bringing the army back from Germany. We're putting them in Wiltshire. Well, a very nice place to go. Didn't need to go to Wiltshire. Napoleon is no longer coming across the channel. <laughs> um, so, so bending spending, taking a strategic view about the billions before you start talking about the multi-billions that is floating around in the world out there. Uh, and I'm back to the Dome and to Paul Reichman and, all, and, and Excel and all these things. There is money in the world today beyond the wildest dreams of Croesus. Just got to find a way of getting it here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chris Wilford from the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators with Global Body for those who work in alternative dispute resolution. Um, thanks very much for talking, Lord Hesseltine, about uh, joined up working and the birth of Canary Wharf. Um, this morning we've heard a lot about housing 
uh, but not very much about schools, doctors' surgeries, and the other things that come with more housing. In Tower Hamlets alone, where Canary Wharf is situated, there's going to be 40, uh, the need for 14,000 extra school places by 2024 to cope with demand. Do you think the current crop of politicians have actually grasped the scale of what they're going to need to build over the coming years? Well, I'd be enormously surprised if they haven't been so advised. Um, I think politicians have quite a capacity to ignore advice. I mean, no, I do remember seriously doing a forecast some many years ago now, simply extrapolating car ownership on the basis of the last 20 years. Well, if you had car ownership reaching by, growing by 2% per annum for 20 years, it doesn't take rocket science to say, well, if it goes on growing 2% per annum, it will look like this. It's just a straight line calculation. And this was denied by the Ministry of Transport. They said these figures mean nothing. But of course, they, 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 they turned up and materialized. But the, thing, the figure I'm looking at, in the moment, which I find quite interesting, is this. There are 7 billion of us. And by and large, we're getting richer by 3% per annum. Uh, so what happens if we go on getting richer by 3% per annum for the next 35 years in the way that we have over the last 35 years? And that's, again, a straight line calculation. And you are, feel, you are dealing with extra wealth in the world of unbelievable scale. Now, of course, a fair whack of it will be enjoyed and rightly so where it is originally created. But a very large sum of it will float up into the ether of globalization looking for homes. So uh, when I did the report, another report I did with the Prime Minister on, um, on Liverpool with Terry Leahy just before we did No Stone Unturned, we discovered that Bill Gates has given £400 million to the Institute of Tropical Medicines in Liverpool. I didn't even know there was an Institute of Tropical Medicine in Liverpool. And I know Liverpool quite well. £400 million, you know? One charitable donation. Money out there is unbelievable. Yes. You, uh, Sean Spear, CPRE. Uh, Lord Heseltine, I, I understand the desire to empower the LEPs actually to sort of get the economy moving and, and particularly to address the sort of areas that you were, you were talking about, the sort of five that are left or whatever it is. Uh, the, the problem from the environmental movement's point of view with the LEPs is that they've achieved the seemingly unachievable of making the last government's regional structures look positively open and accountable and democratic uh, in some cases. Some of the LEPs are doing rather well at reaching out and trying to sort of civil society, considering the environment as well as narrowly economic ends, working with local nature partnerships. Some of them are frankly closed and totally unaccountable and soon to wield quite large powers and quite large sums of money. Do you think there'll have to come a time when the LEPs consider more than just the economy and when they are, when measures are taken to make them slightly more accountable and more open? Well, I, I'm interested to hear someone from the CPRE appear incapable of influencing uh, recaptured LEPs. That was never my experience of the CPRE. But I don't accept some, the analysis. Some of them are some the, of them no, no, but I don't even accept the, the concept that there's no accountability. Um, first of all, a LEP is a partnership between the local authority and the local private sector. They can take no decisions that the local authorities don't go along with, and the local authorities are democratically accountable. If they put forward a plan, it has to go to the government, and the government has to approve it and give the money for it. The government is, elect is democratically accountable. So I don't accept that there's any difference between the LEP and the millions of quangos that are in a very similar situation with very substantial sums of money and very substantial power. Good. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Can we thank our speaker? It was wonderful. Thank you.